forward. Okay, so hopefully you see the whiteboard. Um, now, what we were going to do is we needed to continue on with um, electrophilic addition reactions. And the one we were going to start off with today was um, halogenations. And so typically the ones which, so if you think of halogens, we can think of Cl2, Br2, and I2. So molecular chlorine, molecular bromine, or molecular iodine. So when we look at um, these compounds or these molecules, chlorine is a gas. Um, so manipulating a gas isn't particularly practical. It can be quite dangerous and chlorine isn't the, um, you don't want to be breathing a lot of, breathing in a lot of chlorine. It's um, deadly. Um, so, so there isn't much utility for chlorine in this reaction. Bromine is this really pretty red liquid. Um, And so liquids are easy to manipulate. Uh, bromine is quite dense, actually. It's quite heavy. Um, but you can make a solution with, so you can dissolve it in other compounds. And quite often, the ones you would dissolve it in would be carbon tetrachloride or dichloromethane. So. Both of these are carbon tets become out of favor because of its greenhouse gas. Um, no, sorry, it's ozone killing property. So it's mainly uh, dichloromethane, which is the one which is used uh, often. Iodine, I2, this just isn't reactive enough. It's a solid, um, but its, it's reactivity is, isn't, um, isn't as good great. So it's used less. Um, it's not as, I'll just write here, not as reactive. But it's funny, um, chemists use it as a, um, remember when you did your TLC lab uh, in the fall? Did you guys do the TLC lab virtually? So it is actually used in the TLC lab to is, is one of the compounds that can reveal as a sort of a, what do we call those things? I'm having a, a stain, so to speak. And it actually reveals the presence of uh, double bond. So it is, it, it's, it's used, but it's just not as common. So what almost all of the examples we're gonna use today are bromine because it reacts really quickly and it's a red liquid. And then once it reacts, the red color disappears. So you immediately know, oh, something's happened. And so it's, it's commonly used as a test in, um, you can just do a little, add a drop of red bromine solution to your unknown. And if it disappears right away, there's a really good chance you've got an um, alkene or an alkyne. So it's used as a test. So, and it's working with liquids is far easier than working with gases. So. That's what we're going to do. Okay, so let's see. So let's pretend we've got our alkene and we do a reaction with bromine and we've got our dichloromethane as our solvent. We are going to form, so this reaction is, uh, there is no rich getting richer here. Um, both carbons are going to get a bromine. The key point, though, is that the way that the bromines are situated is that they will be
on opposite sides to one another. So you're going to form these types of compounds, which you would say are, um, they're on opposite sides. So we would say that these are trans. You don't form Put our big red X through this. So this is not formed. So you form the trans compounds, not the cis. Now I can ask you, what is the relationship between A and B? And you would say that these two molecules are Enantiomers, right. So these are enantiomers. So for practicality's sake, we typically only draw one. So um, some of their textbooks, when they draw out products, they will say they'll have a little plus int in the corner. I'm too lazy to even do that, but uh, so I'll just draw one of these products, but the key point is that they are on opposite sides. So if I have a, let's do another example here. Let's do this one. And we do the same reaction with, with bromine. And dichloromethane. I am going to draw so I'm going to add a bromine to each carbon. It doesn't matter which one's forward. So if I put this one forward, the other carbon has to be backward. The key point is I've kept, if you look at the way that I've drawn this molecule, I've kept all of this, this zigzag intact when I've drawn the molecule. So it's still a, it's still the zigzag. As long as one bromine's forward and one bromine's backward, that's the correct answer. And let's do a, this is with a trans double bond. Let's do a cis double bond here. And I don't know why I'm obsessed with drawing those little lone pairs, but I am. Okay, so, and then let's draw this like this. I'm going to keep everything the same and I'm going to draw this bromine forward. And I'm therefore going to draw this bromine backward. And I've kept the way I've drawn this consistent. So it's got this bend in it. It's not a zigzag. If I was to rotate this to, to make a, to to make it into a zigzag, what's gonna end up happening is I'm gonna have this. Because I've rotated through a bond here. If I rotate this bond, I'm gonna end up with, it's now gonna be a zigzag and now they're gonna be on the same side. So if there's a question on a, if there's a question on a test, um, make sure you keep, if you want to just draw one forward and one back, and it doesn't matter which one's forward and which one's back, but if you keep those, if you keep your original skeletal structure consistent, then um, you're not going to go wrong. If you were to start with, uh, say, let's do a, let's do, let's do this here. I'm going to draw this in red because it's wrong. If I was to do the same reaction here, Br, Br, CH2, CH2, and I was to draw this as my product, this would be wrong. Because I have this green, is this sort of bent shape and here it's a zigzag. So I haven't kept everything consistent. So just keep that 
in mind. Um, if you keep this, if you keep the, uh, if you keep the framework the same and you put them trans to one another or put them on opposite sides, you're going to get the right answer. But if you mix up the way that you've drawn the skeletal structure where the double bond is, then this would be wrong. Um, now, I just drew this little, where's my laser? Question. Uh, let me see here. But just before I answer your question, we'll we'll talk about the mechanism in a second. Actually, it's a good question. So the question was, are they on opposite sides because the um, reaction so fast? Actually, we'll do the we'll do the mechanism next. I just wanted to. Where's my laser? Oh, laser. My laser doesn't work on, okay, I'll just use a, stop that. If, when I, when I drew this compound over here, if you don't believe that this equals this, the best thing to do would be to draw a Newman projection and do the rotation yourself. Cause this is in the, the, the way where this over here, this is, uh, this is an eclipsing conformation, the way I've drawn this, whereas this is, it's all staggered. And you, when you do the bond rotation, you'd, you'd find out that this is actually the, what it looks like. Um, if you don't believe me, then yeah, do the Newman projection and do the rotation to make the zigzag. And you'll see that it does, indeed do that. Okay, so the question is why? Uh, why is this trans? Okay, so let's do the first one we did here. Okay, so we've got our ring system. We've got BR, BR. And this attacks the bromine leaves and we form a carbocation. So I'm going to draw this up just for the sake of it. This has got a positive charge. We've got our bromide over here. And so if the next step was that the bromine comes in and um, if the next step was the bromine came in and attacked, would we expect, so this carbon with the positive charges, in our, in our last example, we just said that it was planar, SP, trigonal planar, SP2. We would expect some sort of ratio of 50-50 attack from the top or attack from the bottom. You could say, oh, but you know, there's this big bromine over here and it's blocking it, so we should expect more from the bottom. And I would say, yeah, that's probably true. But should it all be from the opposite side or should we still get some from the top? So there's something which goes on here that is faster than this orange arrow attacking. There's, there's something that happens before that bromine can come in and attack that carbocation. And that something is um, that there's a set of lone pairs that is far closer to that carbocation which can, which can attack it. And those lone pairs are located right here. So, the bromine can attack that carbocation and you end up making this interesting structure like this. And so I'm missing something here. 
and it is a charge, right? So the bromine should have a positive charge, so positive. So we call this the bromonium ion. So the carbon bromine bond is, is, is fairly long and you can form this three, three, three atom ring system and the bromine still carries a positive charge. So it's still, a, it's still like a, it's still, it's, it's still a cation. That positive charge is sometimes people draw it right in the middle of all three to say it's sort of shared between the three atoms. So it's, 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 um, it's stabilized over the three atoms. But what it does forming this is it makes it impossible for the, for, for the Br minus to come in and attack from the top. It can only come in from, it can only come in and attack from the, I'll draw it as a dashed line here. It can only attack from the opposite side and it could attack either carbon, but the key point is it can only attack from the opposite side. So if I draw this as from the side view, and I will draw some lines going back. Proton, proton. And this is a ring, so I'll just draw them going in the background. So the bromide can only attack from the opposite side. So if it attacks the, from the purple arrow, the purple product would be Draw a loop around. And if it attacks from the, let's say, orange arrow, Put on the lone pairs. The key point though is that both of these, they're both trans, right? The bromines are on opposite sides. Trans, trans. These two structures would be enantiomers, but um, you're always going to get trans products. So um, this step here where the bromine attacks the carbocation, I always say if you think of yourself as a molecule and you've got a positive charge on your foot, who can attack your, who can touch your foot faster? You or somebody walking down the street, right? You can touch your foot faster, even if you're not very flexible like me, um, I can still bend over and touch my foot or move my leg and touch my foot faster than someone else could come and touch my foot. So, um, that's basically the way I describe this is that this bromine is attached to, it's on the same molecules that positive charge, so it can attack faster than say a bromine off in, off in the solution somewhere. So whenever you do a bromination reaction, the key point which we'll always be looking for is R, the two bromine atoms trans or not. So that's the key point. So if we're doing this reaction here, I'm gonna say Br methyl Br. And that is gonna be correct. And I could have drawn the other product and this would also be correct. Um, I only need to draw one of them though. So that's the, so if it's a cyclic system, it's easier to do. 
if it's a linear acyclic system, it's a bit uh, harder to draw, but I'll do that in a second. Okay, so this question here, what is the difference between, what, are, what is the relationship between these two molecules here? What are they? Right, these are these two molecules here are enantiomers. So what we do is for, for this reaction here, we are gonna make two enantiomers uh, or the enantiomer the enantiomeric pair. So it doesn't matter which one you draw, as long as you draw them both trans to one another, that's good. If we had this, um, our products will be either this one, Or you can draw this one. As long as the two bromines are trans, then that's then that's good. Like make sure that's a dash. And the intermediate here, if you don't believe me, um, would be if we want to draw this bromonium ion, I would choose. I like drawing them up for some reason. And then the bromide would come in and attack from the opposite side. So if it attacks this carbon, you would get product A, this would be the A route. And if you attacked over here B, this would be B over here. And then this would go up. So the, the key point to the bromination reaction is two bromines are on opposite sides. Uh, there's a question about which route would be more uh, preferred here. Um, because this bromonium is actually flat, I don't think there is much of a difference between the two of them um, st structurally. Now I've drawn the bromonium, whoops, I forgot a positive charge. I've drawn this with this pointing up. If you draw the one pointing down, and you have the bromine attack, you're still going to make product A and you're still going to make product B, um, depending upon which carbon the bromine attacks. So that's what's happening there. So, so if you ever get a question, so one of the questions I probably won't ask ever ask on a test is this. And why is that? Because the, pr the product of this reaction is going to be this. I don't need to draw one up and I don't need to draw one back because free rotation around this bond and the fact that there's no substituents ruins any sort of, um, any sort of, cis or trans out of it. So I'm, I'm not going to answer because the cis and the trans, yeah, it's going to, this carbon here with the, I guess here, because there's no other group attached to it, it's just two protons. It's, um, 
it's not useful for me to. So this question, I'm not going to ask this question because the key point about doing the bromination is, are the two bromines trans? So I'm always going to ask it on a double bond, which is le which is at least got two substituents on opposite sides. So that's. Um, You would make two enantiomers because this is actually technically a chiral center, um, but you'd make a 50-50 mixture of it, which would be this compound here. So, okay, so that's basically the bromination. If is there any questions about that? Because the next thing we're gonna do. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to change the same reaction and we are going to put some water in it. Okay, so interesting. Okay, so let's go here. What's a good example? Right, actually, let's just use the, the previous example. Let's use this. Because there's two things to sort out here. Okay, so let's do this. We're going to do Br2, and we are going to have some water. And for this one, I will use a solvent that um can dissolve both water and organic compounds very well so let's see here carbon dichloromethane is a pretty good it's a good organic solvent it's, uh, it can dissolve organic compounds, no problem. But if you mix it with water, there is a problem. And that is, is that it forms two layers, right? There is, they're not miscible very well in each other. So you form two layers. So in a separatory funnel, which you guys will use shortly, I used short separatory funnel last week, some of you, um, these are going to partition out, so you've got two distinct layers. But there's one organ, well, there's one solvent which dissolves water, and it dissolves organic compounds really well. Do we remember what that one was? It's sometimes called the universal solvent. And it has this structure. Right, DMSO. So this is uh, DMSO, DMSO. So it's a polar aprotic solvent and it can dissolve both organic compounds and, and water. So it, it's a common solvent that's used because it's able to solubilize all of the things. So you've just got one. Now, the product of this reaction is as follows. And it's not this. So you make so the interesting part of this is that water is, um, if you think back to the, if you think back to the mechanism, um, if you think back to the mechanism, water is a nucleophile here. So it replaces the bromide. 
So the first step, if we do the mechanism of this, let's do the mechanism. Let's use a different color. So the mechanism is going to be exactly the same. Okay. And it, So I've drawn it like this basically um, because the I've, I've temporarily got the positive charge on the more substituted carbon. We've got bromide, bromide, bromide over here. So the next step is going to be exactly the same. So it's faster for bromine to touch its it's faster for me to touch my own feet than bromine. And we would have this. So you form the bromonium. In fact, the way that some textbooks draw this mechanism is as follows. They will have, um, if you've got a double bond here, They'll draw their bromine like this. And they will have the, um, these electrons attack the bromine, this leave, and then there'll be another arrow coming down to form the to form the bromonium. So that's what's like, that's the way that some textbooks draw this. Um, what is problematic? It's not that it's, it's, why is drawing it like this in some ways unhelpful? from a conceptual standpoint. Like, yeah, which, which arrow is first, right? Um, of all of these three arrows, which one takes place first? So if the point you're trying to get across is that double bonds are acting as the nucleophiles in these types of reactions and that um, the bromine is the electrophile. It, this doesn't really, you've got three arrows here and it's hard to know which one is the one taking place first. So that's why whenever I'm drawing this, I sort of, I go through the step of making this carbocation where and then the bromine attacks that. So you got the bromonium. Okay, then the next step is that we've got uh, water and it's gonna come along and um, it's going to attack Now, in this case, it's actually specific that it, it only attacks one of these two carbons. It doesn't attack the one in the red. So this doesn't happen. So our products over here at the top, you will notice that, and this is a really a key point here, is that the OH goes on the more 
substituted carbon. The bromine is on the least substituted carbon. So we don't do the, the, the one I got not here, that's incorrect. So you make, um, the OH is gonna go on the more substituted carbon, which you might say to yourself seems to be odd, right? Why would this be odd the way I've drawn this little attack right right here. Why might this be a bit odd? So we're saying that the purple arrow is the arrow which takes place and it's not the red arrow. That's why I got the big, I erased it. Why, why having the OH attack that more substituted carbon? Why is that a bit odd? It's right, it's, it's attacking the more substituted carbon. So shouldn't there be more steric hindrance there, right? It's actually attacking the, the, the interior of the molecule. Shouldn't it be more sterically hindered? And the way that this is explained is that when you're thinking about um, the bonds of this bromonium, I'm going to draw two the brom same bromonium ion each time. And the little dashed line is basically representing that the bond is is about to be broken. And I'm going to put in a little delta plus here to say that okay, this is being this this carbon's developing a positive charge or this carbon's develop developing a positive charge because that bond is being broken. Which of these two positive partial positive charges is more stable, A or B? Okay, a couple people have said A, and why is that? That's correct. Yeah, it's got more R groups, just like for carbocation stability. So it's got more R groups. So this part, this the breaking of this bond on carb on on a molecule A is lower in energy. So if the hydroxyl hydroxyl the water, sorry, if it's coming into attack, this is the lower energy pathway. Even though there's some, there might we might say there's some steric issues. Consistently, you you get the the breaking of the um, more substitute the carbon with the with the um, more substituents on it. So this is a really interesting reaction in the sense that it's SN one like because of the partial positive charge on the more substituted carbon, but it's also SN two like because the hydro the water is attacking from the opposite side. So it's a combination of the two. It's, it's quite a interesting reaction. So SN2 like because OH water attacks on opposite side. SN1 like because partial positive on more substituted carbon. Right, okay, and then the next part here is that once you've done the reaction, you will have um, R, H, E, R, H, H. Oxygen will have a positive charge. 
And then water is gonna come along and deprotonate that. So you will end up with a little bit of H3O plus and Br minus in your solution until the end of the reaction. So that is basically, this reaction when you add water to it is called, um, I, I guess I should say that this is a, Halo hydrin. It's a really old name. When you've got a hydroxyl group beside an alkyl halide, they call these halo hydrins. So this is basically a halo um, hydrin reaction. Okay, so there might be a question here that I've left out. And that question is what? Okay, so the thing I would, the, the, what, what I'm getting at is, okay, so I've got water attacking that bromonium ion. What about, why not, why not him? Why not bromide? So you, um, statistically, there's just so many more water molecules in the reaction that, because it's the solvent that the water takes place. But you could get a side reaction with, with the bromide itself attacking it. So there is a um, modification to this reaction that prevents um, the bromide from attacking. And that is the use of this molecule here. And this guy is what we is called NBS. It's N bromo succinamid. Hopefully I spelled that right. Um, and the interesting thing about this molecule is that this is a source of Br plus, I'll put it in quotes, and BR radical, in quotes. So you can use this, uh, you can use this uh, as a source of, of BR plus and BR radical. We'll see the radical part later on. So your alkene, if this attacks, it's gonna attack there and then those electrons are going to move on to the nitrogen. And the nice part is, is that the leaving group here is the succinamid anion. And because this negative charge is stabilized by resonance on both carbonyls, it's, it's basically non-nucleophilic. So, um, or less nucleophilic than the, um, than just bromide. So it's so often NBS is used instead of Br2 if you're trying to do the halo, um, if you're trying to do the halo hydrin reaction. So let's do an example here. Okay, um, yes, it is almost the end of class. NBS, think about this reaction here. Or this reaction here.
think of these before next class because uh, these will be the ones I actually I'll ask um, in class for the uh, pre, pre the start of it. Just think of both of these um, because there's two with the with the with the presence of water. There's two things you have to think about now: where the OH goes and making sure that the two groups are on opposite sides. Okay, so what I'll do is I'm gonna um, post all this back on uh, Top Hat like we did the last one. So if there's uh, stuff that we didn't, you didn't write down, you can just look at it like that. Okay. Yes, the room, if you haven't done the lab yet, the room is 428 in the Brody building. So if you've never been there, basically you take the elevator up to the fourth floor and then you would have, did you, if you did the Gen Chem lab, you basically did a quick left and then a quick right. And the Gen Chem lab was there. For the organic lab, just once you get out of the elevator, you go left and then you go right. Walk to the end of the hall, take a right, and then you'll pass the stairs, which lead down, and it's the first room on your right, 428. Okay. So, um, have a good day. I'll see um, everybody on Thursday. I'm actually going to be in on a Wednesday evening for a, a, one of the labs anyway, so I might run into you there too. Okay. All right, and I will post this on Moodle as soon as the, uh, sorry, on Top Hat as soon as everything is edited and that sort of stuff. Okay. All right, have a good day. Thank you, you too.